What I'm going to talk about is um, an excavation that we did in 2022, uh, an eight month or eight and a half month excavation on, as uh, Judith said, on the site of the old Oki White store, which was purchased by the Pembrokeshire County Council as part of their European funded development of Haverford West programme. And as you can see from this, uh, it's quite an old aerial photograph. This is the 1980s. You can see the castle sitting up on its rocky outcrop above and the Western Clethai to along here. So it sits in what would have been the medieval, uh, later medieval town of Haverford West. And if you remember this store, which I don't, um, <laughs> It was a sort of iconic store of Haverford West. Now, I'm cutting short a lot of the history of this area, but to, there's just to point out two things that we, um, when we were working with Pembrokeshire County Council, in the very early stages, we were asked to look at the history of the site to give them some indications of what the impacts might be on archeology. span and um, one of the main phases, if you like, of this uh, site, before it was the Occhioite store, was that it was the site of the Mary Church foundry. And if, and this, I love this picture because it shows you how much Haverford West has changed since the 1950s. And that arrow points to the Mary Church foundry and there's the Western Clethai, which has allowed that area now on the east side of the river is now a shopping development. But you can see in the past it was allowed to flood. It was the floodplain of the Clethai in this point. You see the old bridge in the background, which is on the site of a medieval bridge. And so the, you can imagine this urban centre developing around that castle site above it on this western side of the Clethai. So, and I am really skipping through this, but this is the 1889 first edition, first, uh, 1 to 500 map. And this, the red outline shows you the development area that um, used to uh, have the old Oki White store on that Pembrokeshire County Council bought. And this, uh, there's a few little giveaways about what else might be here other than the Clethai Ironworks or the uh, Mary Church Ironworks. Is that it says a little X marks the spot, convent of Blackfriars, site of a convent being a monastic house of either women or men. But Blackfriars being um, the Dominicans known for their black habits. And I don't mean they're bad habits, I mean <laughs> that they wore black habits. So, you know, pretty good giveaway. There's also things like the Friars Pub, which wasn't always the Friars, but there it is next to the Friars Lane, and the hole in the wall lane, allegedly where the poor were fed through um, by the Friars. And the Friars we're talking about, the Friary we're talking about is the Friary of St. Saviour's which we know was founded by 1246 from documentary references. So, but the trouble is when you start these pieces of work, when we, we're involved, not um, we were involved, we were contracted and commissioned as a commercial piece of work to um, help uh, to uh, offer, well no, to provide archeological services but they, at the time, it's, it's quite a... <laughs> people ask us, why didn't they know that there were burials there right from the beginning? Why did they develop a site when they sh you know, should have known? Should they not have known that there were burials there? Because I, I think you all know I'm going to carry on and talk about burials. But they didn't know because there's been very little development in this area that would have given them and the archaeological advisors to the planning authority uh, cause to raise that significance up as, as that would have influenced their decision to develop the site. 
it's, it's all very, it's never as straightforward as you think. But to cut a long story short, when they bought the site, the first thing that you do when you're going to develop it is that you have to look at the ground conditions to see how, you know, you could have, how do you design your foundations. And when they did that, we monitored those excavations, those geotechnical works, and we immediately found that about a metre to two metres down, we had burials in this area and this area. This area was always out of, the, it was absolutely packed with asbestos. And this area, we found, we didn't see a great deal in those first geotechnical works, but was ruled out eventually um, because to allow the development to progress without bankrupting it really, um, we had to allow excavation to carry on in uh, the development to carry on in here and here so that we could excavate in here and here. And that was the compromise. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to whiz through what it's like when you first, uh, how the excavation progressed. And this is what it's like when you come onto site in November 21. It's, uh, I mean, it's an appalling mess. And uh, what your first role is to do is, is to spend days, if not weeks, clearing the site up and getting to a point where you can excavate it. If I move on, just this is where we started the excavation. That's that area that's called A2. And this we had to excavate prior to reaching anything of medieval date of about a metre plus of uh, industrial um, remains, if you like, the consequences of hundreds of years of industrial activity on this site, mostly in the form of iron foundry works of, of different periods. And as you can see, we still have some of the remains of the casting pits. But beneath that, what I'm going to concentrate and talk to today is um, the uh, results from the late medieval period. And here you can see there's Alex at the top there. Um, she wasn't always a finds person. <laughs> um, excavating the first burials that became in this area, became visible underneath the industrial the, the <coughs> overburden. Now in this small area, this gave us an indication of what we might find in the bigger area. We had 17 burials, intercutting burials, all east-west aligned, all in this area shroud burials, so east-west aligned, definitely Christian burials. Shroud burials is they're not buried in a coffin, very simply buried in a, a, a in one piece of linen that's wrapped around them, and with their arms crossed, arms crossed across their chest. And you can see this one just shows you an example of how his lower body. I don't know it, I don't actually know if it's a male or a female, but I always call them he, um, was truncated by a later casting pit. So this small area we did of A2 confirmed what we'd seen in the geotechnical pits, that we had a cemetery, but in this little area we had no evidence of buildings. These uh, burials are cut through the old river gravels, but no sign of any building. When we get onto the main area, we had to excavate a huge amount of industrial remains, uh, the spaghetti junction of drainage. And then when we removed all that 18th, 19th century disturbance, we came onto a, what was, I think, a period of inactivity where little happened, but what did happen was we had this underneath all that industrial uh, activity and the consequences of that was um, a, an area of building rubble, demolition rubble I would call it, on the southern edge of the trench that tapered off towards the north. It, felt, it gave us the impression that it had been pushed over from the south and within that material were lots uh, of fragments of stone carving. 
The little arm you can see on the right comes from a tomb. You see this little angel and um, fragments of column capital and some lovely early 13th century encaustic tile, floor tiles. Um, many of which um, are similar to other churches in West Wales of this period, including specifically Carew. So we, when we took all, so all that material comes from a building somewhere, but it's not a building that's here. Because once we took all that off, we came down onto this lovely, well, dirty, lovely, if you like to call it, um, very consistent soil. And here you can see a fantastically, <laughs> it turned out to be enormous, uh, a wall with enormous foundations running parallel with Bridge Street, right at the end of our uh, excavation area. But through that, you can just see, I think, the odd skull poking through and someone's foot, <coughs> someone's foot down there. But at this stage, we are now over just on the cusp of 120 down from current ground surface and would, uh, as soon as you hit 120 you're not allowed to dig any further spe speci specifically in an excavation like this where you're working between two standing buildings so uh, what we had to do then negotiate with Pembrokeshire County Council to shore the site up to insert metal sheeting either side of the excavation area to hold the earth back and to prevent any movement in the walls either side. This is quite an undertaking because by now the end, you see at the top, that's where we started our excavation, is now part of the development and we are completely hemmed in. So the only way was to crane in a machine and the piles and to insert these sheet piles either side with bracing to allow us to excavate at any depth. And that's what it looks like once we got back onto site. So immediately you're incredibly constrained by the area that you have to dig in. And it's okay when you're starting at this level, you could actually hop over these braces but when you start digging a little bit lower, you can't, your legs aren't long enough to get over them and you have to crawl under them. But that's what, when we first started excavating, when the sheet piling had gone in, that's how the first uh, skeletons, the first burials uh, appeared. But what became very clear was that this was a complex, um, what uh, arrangement of burials over m many, many years. And we're probably talking between the sort of the 14th and 16th centuries that this cemetery was in use. So this is this east wall, at the, sorry, west wall at the top that runs parallel with Bridge Street. Yeah, sorry if I get my east and west mixed up. But it was an amazingly complicated active cemetery that was continually being turned over and over and over again. So disarticulated, so uh, uh, burials were being disturbed by later burials and those were being thrown back with previous ones. And this was turned over and over again over se some period of time. So the archeologists, the team did an amazing job in trying to work out who's, who was who and working underneath the sheet piling sometimes trying to remove people. As you can see, this, this has been cut away by an, an burial that's already excavated. This poor gentleman's left, lost his head. We think actually he was beheaded. And equally, when they, uh, it was such an active cemetery with this constant turnover, of burials 
that they had real problems to know what to do with the skulls and the long bones of the burials that they then disturbed. And this one was quite amazing. When they buried this person here in their shroud, they then had about five skulls that they decided, well, we'll just put them around his head and we'll put another couple between his legs. And it, it um, was so in, and equally what was quite clear was that th there was a lot of pathology, just obvious to ourselves, and we're not osteologists, but you can see this skull here has been sliced off on the back, one side of the back of the skull with, um, by a very sharp implement. So I want to try and give you the impression of just how dense these burials are, how many there were, how uh, complicated the mess of burials over this period of time in this cemetery. And we had what I now know, because we are starting to get the results of the osteological work that Cardiff University are carrying out, is that one of these is trepanation and the other is actually a crossbow bolt wound. And this poor person, who isn't, was a man, um, is suffering the effects of being hit multiple times by a very sharp sword, at least uh, seven times, and probably the first blow would have killed him. Now, we did have the odd find. This is a Christian cemetery, so very few, if any, grave goods, but the odd find came up, That's, that isn't his shoulder, that's somebody else's pelvis, is um, a, a water bucket handle, holy water bucket handle. And occasionally we found group burials, um, which in our heads we went, oh, there must be a family, but as, as we've just received um, from Cardiff University, the first results from the isotope analysis of the, uh, mostly the uh, dental enamel of, uh, and these weren't, these people were not related, but very ill. And occasionally a burial that gave you a salutary reminder that what we're looking at are the remains of people. Luke mentioned that archeology span is about people. It's about history of people. And sometimes we get so involved in objects and sites that we forget what we're seeing are the results of, of people, of human beings. And this, and, the, and especially with the very young child burials, it was a reminder that these are the remains of human beings who lived in Haverford West and had families, occupations, and this one where this little child with the par possible parents' arms across. So that's the child's skull. The adult's is below. And it just reminds you of, of this is a reflection of the, the community that lived at ha in Haverford West at the time. So this is, a, this is a, one of our first plans. We're just starting to do the post-excavation now. And this is our middle phase of burials. This is the sort of densest, the ones we can't really pull apart. So we have some later ones, but this, as you can see, the little crossed arms means it's a shroud burial by their side means it's a coffin. And what we have here is this uh, west wall, um, runs Pat Bridge Street is here, and the Western Clethi is down here. And what we think we, pardon me, we have is um, this wall has been rebuilt many times, but the remains of this north wall are of uh, an earlier structure. If I go back. So one of the first findings of the isotope uh, analysis is that the majority of people in this area are mostly local. They lived in the uh, around about 10 kilometer radius of Haverford West. They're not all, but the majority are of the ones that they have sampled. But we then have two distinct groups, a group who were buried here on the west side of the, this wall. And if you can see 
um, little stone areas, rectangular stones. These crypts are the burials in there, which were much by far our earliest burials. And the burials at the end were all very distinctive, all adults, all coffin burials, all stacked, all robust individuals, no trauma. And what's interesting is the isotope analysis seems to indicate that these individuals, a good number of, I mean, we're only talking about 11, so this is always a sample of a sample, came from further afield. So they're less local, if you like, and they could have come from southwest England, Ireland, or perhaps a little further afield. At the east end of the area that I showed you that we were excavated, what we came down to when we started excavating the burials, we realised that these little bits of stone that were poking out of the soil were actually crypts, stone crypts, very much cut through and mostly in some areas completely removed by later burials. And those crypts must be at the east end of a church. And we think what we have is this is our early, this is an, a little church. And we think our suggestion is that it's the earliest phase of church for, of St. Saviour's Friary. When they first came to Haverford West, they wouldn't have had the money to have built something substantial, but they built quite a small church, about 26 metres long. And this is the remains of the altar. And here we have a sequence of burials in crypts. And what's interesting, this is what it looked like towards the east end when we're getting near the end of the excavation, is that this burial here, right in the northeast corner of what I'm, I'm saying is the earliest, an early phase of church, is the only one that had definite grave goods. And this, and this is a man, and he has a lead heart box in his hands, which has been completely squashed, I'm afraid. And what is interesting about this gentleman is we think he comes from northern France. So he's come the most distance. He's buried in the most auspicious place in uh, the church. And he shows his, he was very healthy as far as his bones are concerned, only, only some of the pathology on his bones. But there's no trauma, as were, there was no trauma in any of the burials in the crypt. So you've got this distinction between the group at the far end, who, who could be from the monastic house, as could some of these people, but equally they're better fed. The isotopes give us that information. They come from a wider area and they suffer less trauma. And that's just an example of a heart box from uh, Cork, from Christ Church in Cork. And, you know, we are at the right, we're at the end of the Crusades, but could it be that that gentleman who's buried in that court is holding his loved ones, his father or his son? I'm going to skip that bit. But just to say that we are at the very, very beginning of understanding what um, this collection of uh, uh, human remains, these skeleton, the skeletal remains of these humans, what they can tell us. I haven't, we haven't received the osteological report yet. But what it shows is this, you know, this vibrant, lively, violent in places, um, active town of Haverford West, and how much it was thriving economically at this time. Um, I mean, I didn't hint, but the, the Franciscan is a mendicant order. It su survives on, on arms, so it has to sit in the urban town of, uh, as, as do the Franciscans. They need the, an urban town to support them. 
And um, what we think is, oh, I'm going to have to skip that one as well, that what, <laughs> at the moment, that we have a little, in our excavations, we found the remains of uh, the earliest church of St. Saviour's Friary, that later was uh, abandoned and demolished. That north wall was demolished and levelled, as were the crypts. And the east wall, much like perhaps as happened in Norwich, becomes part of the claustral range. And the church is rebuilt to the south. And that material that you saw pushed over onto the cemetery is the final, is all the broken, is the, the final demolition of that church in a much later period. And that's just an idea. It's a reconstruction of Blackfriars in Bristol. Just to show you, but to give you an impression of how that, uh, the Blackfriars would have sat within that town of Haverford West at the base of the, of the castle, next to the river. So there's a lot more, we've got so much more to do. Um, and we'll know a lot more about Haverford West at this time, what the people were doing, what they were eating, what they were, what their uh, occupations, what illnesses they had. Um, but one of the things I have to say, because I must say this, and we all say to thank the volunteers, because without them, where would we be for all the huge amount of work they put in? But I, uh, if, I'd ever, if I'd known at the start of this excavation how many bones it would generate, I would have probably resigned yeah. and gone somewhere else. Um, because it's one thing to think, oh, yes, we can cope with a, a few burials. But if you can see in the picture behind them, the floor of plastic bags and the sheer cost if we had done it ourselves. But the volunteers came every day to 16 Bridge Street, a shop across from the uh, owned by Empty Shop, <coughs> and worked tirelessly for oh, about six months washing. Became quite a, a social club. And all, every, all the uh, people used to, because they could see through the shop windows what we were doing, it became an active museum. And, and Alex and Bethan both uh, did a wonder, wonderful PR job with uh, all the uh, occupant, you know, everyone living in Haverford West loves it. They used to come in every day to see uh, what we were doing, what our latest find was. And they all said how a wonderful thing it was to see this aspect of the work. Everyone often watches things on Digging for Britain and everything, but they don't see this huge amount of work that goes on behind. Um, so it was a fantastic, um, fantastic project to be involved with and a real privilege to do it. Um, and I just hope that um, we do a good job with the post-excavation. We have a lot of people working on it, and the specialist reports are just starting to trickle in. But we've got a long way to go yet. So, sorry, that's a very quick whiz through. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.